to me. Never thought I'd fall again so easily. Oh, love, you wouldn't lie to me. The spectacular Boz Skaggs. I, uh, I do want to... Uh, uh, point out for the people who are not on Facebook Live that you were jamming out <laughs> lip syncing to this. I love that end. song. I love that song. I love Boss Skaggs. Love, look what you've done to me. See, that's that's the theme song for us. There you go. Caregivers. <laughs> Hope for the caregiver. Welcome back to the show for caregivers about caregivers hosted by a caregiver. I am Peter Rosenberger bringing you three decades, not one, not two, three decades into my fourth decade as a caregiver to help give you some things I've learned the hard way. I mean, those of you watching on Facebook Live, look at me. I'm only 30. Look what it, <laughs> look what it did to me. Well, uh, speaking of, uh, Ed, Ed, has informed me, me. <laughs> Ed has informed me that that was on the Urban Cowboy soundtrack, by the way. It was, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. John Travolta and Deborah Winger. Hey, there you go. Uh, see, I know my meaningless trivia. <laughs> Uh, I, I have this ability to memorize entire episodes of, of shows and obscure movie stuff, and I haven't figured out a way to make a living at it's it like, yet. And yet, and there's so many other things. <laughs> so many other things that would be more, <laughs> worthwhile putting in my head. But I, uh, and by the way, if you want to be on the show, 877-655-6755. That is Ed. John was talking about Ed. Ed's in Dallas at Salem Radio Network, who syndicates this show. We are the nation's only syndicated radio program for the family caregiver. And we are heard literally from Alaska to Miami. And uh, thrilled to have you along with this. Uh, give a big shout out to the folks at the Truth Network uh, all around the country as well that carries the show. And they do such a great job and been such an encouragement to me on this. This show is a, is a, um, is a mission for me because I, I didn't have something like this for so long. There was nothing like this. I didn't, I didn't even have people even understanding how to speak to me in this. And that, one, that, I want, that brings me to a topic I want to weigh into. And, and for those of you who are listening who are not caregivers, this is specifically for you. Normally I don't address you, but I want to address you here on this particular issue. So for those of you who are caregivers, just take a break for a second and uh, have a cup of coffee or something. Just take a break because I'm going to talk to those who are not caregivers right now. Uh, when, we, when we had the shooting in Annapolis a couple of weeks ago, and I watched something happen across the media that – it, it just, I don't know, it just hit me kind of wrong. And everybody was saying, everybody was saying, without exception, it just everywhere you turn, our thoughts and prayers are with the families and victims. And I thought it ought to be a template on social media. You know, John, it was just like, I mean, that's all they were saying. And they would just gloss over it. In, in the past, we would put our hands over our mouth in horror. And now we just want to say our thoughts and prayers are with the families and victims. And we and we then we move on. I mean, it, it's like like that's enough. Well, it's this mantra that we just repeat, and it makes us feel good about you know. Oh, we we've demonstrated that we care. We have we have we have dispensed the appropriate compassion, our thoughts and prayers. Well, for those of us who go through horrific circumstances, and I'm not comparing with the the shooting or thing. I'm just talking about just in life in general. Those people right there that went through that, they are forever altered by that. And, and, and how, how should they respond to that when somebody says that? Because the questions that come from me when people said it to me are, what thoughts, what, what are you praying? You're, you're telling me that you're going to God Almighty, El Shaddai, El Adonai, Jehovah Jireh, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and you're asking him what? And you want me to do what with that information? Now think about what we just said. We're praying for you. Well, what are you asking? Are you going to ask for Gracie's legs to grow back? Are you going to ask for her to be out of pain? Is it, 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 what am I to do with this information? And I, I wrote on our, our blog at standingwithhope.com a piece about this. It's called A Deeper Consolation. And I've thought about this a lot. Over, over a period of time, because I've had people come up, and, and I've, I've used this analogy before. It's like going to the post office, and you're carrying a bunch of, of boxes, and somebody looks at you, and they say, brother, you look to be burdened down. I'm going to pray for you. Well, hold the door while you do it. I mean, 
Honestly, man, no, no, that <laughs> right there. I mean, Hold the door while you do it. Yeah, you know? I mean, I mean, I've, I've got a box in my hand. You go pray for it. Well, thank you. Can you hold the door? You know, I think that's the thing is, as, as believers, as people of faith, can we go deeper? Can we offer more? Can we do something different? I, I look at what, what Jesus talked about the Good Samaritan. And go back and look at the text. He didn't say our thoughts and prayers are with the victim. He saw, he noticed, he approached, and he ministered to, got the person to safety, and then provided with some type of sustainable care afterwards. Now, that's, this is if you got a problem with that, take it up with Jesus, because he's the one who told the story. I'm just relaying the, the story, the text. I'm just telling you that's what happened. And the inference is this is the model. So how does that apply to what we're talking about? There's tragedy every day in the news. There's tragedy every day around us. We don't have to go looking for it. It's all around us. You can't go off your street without encountering somebody who's going through something. They just may not be telling you something. I looked at, um, I, I, was, I saw the old tape of, um, Tape. We don't even use the word tape anymore, John, do we? I saw the old video recreation. <laughs> what am I supposed to say? <laughs> video of it. Well, I need to know what it was. I don't know what it was. Anyway, so it was when, when George W. Bush was on that pile of rubble in 9-11. Mm -hmm. And the, the older fireman was there, and he put his arm around him. You remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've met that guy. Oh, neat. I, when, we, when we were in, in uh, Madison Square Garden in 2004, Gracie opened the second night of the Republican National Convention. And we were downstairs in the green room with that guy. And I was asking him about it. He said, well, I really wasn't supposed to be there. And, and I, but I, got my, I retired, but I grabbed my gear and I went down and did it anyway. So did Steve Buscemi, by the way. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And um, he said, I'm working, and they said, somebody big is coming today, but they didn't tell us who. And all of a sudden, I'm sitting there working, and over the hill, here comes the President of the United States. And he said, I had nowhere to go, and I just kind of froze there. And he comes up, and he puts his arm around me. And he starts talking to the people. And he, do you remember what he said? When, when the guys yelled out from distance, they said, we can't. He was talking, and he said, we can't hear you. And he grabbed a bullhorn, and what did he say? He said, I can hear you. We all hear you, and pretty soon the people that knock these buildings down are going to hear you, okay? Now, what's the lesson from leadership on that? Because leadership in suffering often means speaking specifically into it and recognizing it for what it is. Sentiment doesn't cost anything. Caring does. We don't have to give sentiment. We have to give action when people are suffering. And that doesn't mean we have to fix it. We, we can't fix it. It st starts with seeing or hearing them. If you go back and look at the story of the Good Samaritan, he saw the man beaten and laying there by the road. Now, the other people saw him too, but they just went away. But this guy saw it and then moved towards it. This is what I'm talking about as caregivers, that we have been the recipient so many times of people who just don't even see it. They don't hear it. They don't listen. They just, our thoughts and prayers are with the families and the victims and leave us to kind of just flounder in our own heartache. And I'm saying that as believers, if you want to minister to somebody who is doing this, stop for a moment. Just stop for a moment and look at them and say, if you don't know what to say here, I'll give you some words. If you don't know what to say, if you're a pastor listening to this right now and you really don't know what to say to people, if you're a counselor and you don't know what to say, if you're just somebody that just wants to be able to better reflect Christ in this, here's, here's some words that will help. Look at them and stop and quietly say these words. I see you. And I see the magnitude of what you're carrying. And I hurt with you. And I'm going to work to make sure that you're not doing this alone. If you do nothing else but say those words, I promise you, caregivers across the country will look at you and big tears will form in their eyes because you will be speaking directly to their heart. 
That's how you do it. It's not that complicated, but it does cost you something. It costs you engaging from your heart, not doing a template that says our thoughts and prayers are with the families and the victims. It costs you time and empathy. It costs you your heart. It does. And it, it doesn't have to be complicated. Leadership is like that. It doesn't have to be complicated. Don't think about it. But that's leadership and suffering. And sometimes, if you notice, that President Bush was standing in carnage saying these things. And that's what leadership does. We, we have to stand in carnage and see it for what it is and hear the hearts of the people who are faced with that carnage, who are cleaning that carnage, who are digging through that carnage. And if we're not willing to do that, then what's our faith all about? What is this whole thing of Christianity all about if we're not willing to do that? Honestly, do we just put on robes and go isolate ourselves from some, everything else? I, I don't think that's the whole point of this. You know, and, and please don't think that you've got to be somehow, you've got to come up with something brilliant. In the Army, sometimes leadership is the, is the guy that remembers where the Jeep is parked. You know, I mean, you do, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Sometimes the person who knows how to get out of the quagmire, the, the quicksand that we're often in. And I just felt like that some folks out there may find that helpful. 877. 655-6755, if that's something that you've been wrestling with and you, you just don't know what to say, you don't have to show up with a casserole. I know in the South, we got it covered when people are going through short-term stuff. You know, wherever two or three are gathered, there's macaroni and cheese. I got that. We know what to do. But sometimes you got to do more than just cook a casserole. And it doesn't mean that you have to you know, subsidize everybody or, or anybody for that matter. But what it does mean is that we open our hearts and ask, ask, if you don't know how to do it, ask God to help you to do it, to open your eyes, open your ears and see what's around you. You do not have to go looking for sorrow and tragedy. It's all around you. And I know too many people who are pushing a wheelchair while their own hearts are breaking. I know too many people who are dealing with an aging parent that they can't engage with anymore, but they're having to just spend all the time dealing with. A young man I know today was having lunch and had to leave because his father had just made a god-awful mess all over the house and called him and asked him to come take care of him. Kid's in his 20s. How do, you, how do you minister to a young man like that? How do you let him know that what he's doing is important, that it's honoring God because he's honoring his dad and cleaning up all this mess? And for those of you caregivers, you know what I mean. I don't have to get graphic. How do you strengthen that young man's heart? How do you speak to those frustrating feelings and the, and the anger and the resentment and the tears and the sorrow, all that stuff. How do you speak to that with our thoughts and prayers or with the families and victims? Doesn't that sound trite to you? It sounds trite to me. And if we don't know what to say, we don't have to fill up the space with meaningless words. And as a person of faith, if you don't know what to say, ask for what to say. If any man lacks wisdom, let him ask, James says. Well, just ask. And right now you're getting it. I'm giving you the script. So there's no excuse. And just look at these, look at their eyes. Look at their tired eyes. Look at their tired hands. Look at their stooped shoulders. Look at their graying hair. And let them know that you see them, that they are not invisible, that they're not toiling away in obscurity, that they're doing something that has value, that has kingdom value, that, that touches the very heart of God himself. Can you do that? Would you do that? Would you just be willing to do that for someone? That's how you touch a, a caregiver's heart. That's how you touch somebody who is suffering. Please don't try to make up words because it's too hard. But sometimes you can just look at them 
Just look at them and let them know that you see them. This is Hope for the Caregiver. 877-655-6755. I'm Peter Rosenberger. And I'm on a mission to give a well-lit path to the family caregiver, to safety, where they can catch their breath and take, take a knee. I'm on a mission to teach folks a vocabulary of what it looks like to actually minister to someone who is suffering. I'm on a mission to grab as many of my fellow caregivers and let them know that God has not abandoned them. Join me on that mission. Join me on it. Hopeforthecaregiver.com. we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Here's some great news. If you missed the deadline to sign up for health insurance or if you signed up for a plan you're not happy with, you still have a choice. MediShare is a healthcare sharing program. Hundreds of thousands of Christians are part of this. It can save you a lot. Typical savings for a family is about 500 bucks a month. You can join MediShare anytime. It's easy to call and look into it. There's no pressure at all. And man, what a difference it can make. 855-25-SHARE. That's 855-25-SHARE. Have you ever struggled to trust God when lousy things happen to you? I'm Gracie Rosenberger, and in 1983, I experienced a horrific car accident leading to 80 surgeries and both legs amputated. I questioned why God allowed something so brutal to happen to me, but over time, my questions changed, and I discovered courage to trust God. That understanding, along with an appreciation for quality prosthetic limbs, led me to establish Standing with Hope. For more than a dozen years, we've been working with the government of Ghana and West Africa, equipping and training local workers to build and maintain quality prosthetic limbs for their own people. On a regular basis, we purchase and ship equipment and supplies, and with the help of inmates in a Tennessee prison. We also recycle parts from donated limbs. All of this is to point others to Christ, the source of my hope and strength. Please visit standingwithhope.com to learn more and participate in lifting others up. That's standingwithhope.com. I'm Gracie, and I am Standing With Hope. 